So how would you answer the question if someone asks you, what's your church's worship style? How would you answer that question? You know what answer I would love to give to that question? Our style is all of life thankful surrender to God in Christ Jesus by the power of his Holy Spirit. Yeah. <laughs> all of life thankful surrender to God in Christ Jesus by the power of his Holy Spirit. Maybe Maybe a, a simpler way, a, a different way to put it would be, our style is to do everything we do to the glory of God. We are continuing our, our series uh, today talking about our core values. What are the things that we say that we value the most? Um, and we've talked about prayer and biblical teaching, and today we start to talk about worship. Perhaps some of you have seen this graphic before uh, posted up here in announcement slides in the past. As we think about this topic of worship, if you're expecting me to talk about which music style is best, you'll be disappointed. If, on the other hand, you want to know what the Bible has to say about worship, and, and what it should look in our lives personally and corporately, then I trust God will have much to say to you, as, as he has to say to all of us. We're starting off talking about worship from sort of what I would want to call the 30,000-foot perspective. You know when you're on a plane, you look out the window at 30,000 feet, and it's like you can see an entire state below you, it seems like. That's where we're starting this morning, asking the question, what does worship really mean biblically? How does the Bible define this, this whole topic of worship? And I want to turn to Romans chapter 12 to do that. We're going to get to Hebrews chapter 13, which Paul read for us a little earlier. But I want to start off at 30,000 feet, looking at Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Romans chapter 12 comes after a long discussion, the first 11 chapters, of the gospel. The truth that we have rebelled against God. We have gone our own way. And God has every right to punish us with eternal damnation in hell, with death. But God, because of his mercy, has taken that death upon himself, the personal work of Jesus Christ. He sent his son, second person of the Trinity, to take that punishment for us. So that by faith in him, we too can have eternal life. We can have a renewed relationship with him. And, and Paul has been unpacking this gospel message, and how does it relate to what God was doing in the Old Testament with the children of Israel and all this stuff? And he gets to chapter 12, and he gets to the, at chapter 12 is sort of a turning point in the book of Romans to say, you know, here's verse, chapters 1 through 11 are all the truths of the gospel. This is what the gospel means. And then 12 and following is, now here's what it should mean for us. Here's how it should impact our lives. And so he talks about, you know, how we, the marks of a true Christian, how we submit to authorities, uh, uh, the, the importance of loving one another, all these different things. But he begins this with this kind of summary. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. The, the ESV translation that I'm reading from here uses the term uh, spiritual worship. NIV in the back of this seat in front of you says true and proper worship. This is the summary statement of what worship 
really is. What, is, what does he say here? Therefore, in view of God's mercy, you know, because of all this, because of all the truths of the gospel, because of all these things that I've been saying for the past 11 chapters, I urge you, I appeal to you, Paul is saying, this is a serious matter, this is not some optional side issue, I'm urging you to do what? To offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, bodies, when he talks about offering your bodies there, he's not just talking about the physical part of us. It's, it's, it's talking about the encompassing of, of all of who we are. Offer all of yourself as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. What was a sacrifice? It was an animal that was set apart, set apart for worship to God. We, ourselves, are supposed to be that, set apart to God's will and to his service. And he says that, that kind of whole self, setting apart, surrendering yourself to God, offering yourself as that living sacrifice, that is your true and proper worship. It's interesting that that last phrase there, those last couple of words, it's two words. And translators kind of struggle with, okay, what do we, what do, we do with these two words? Because the first word carries with it the idea of spiritual, spiritual, but also rational. Like there's, this is a thinking act. And so do we, do we put in here, you know, this is your spiritual act of worship, or this is your rational act of worship, this is your thinking act of worship. We don't just do it mindlessly. We do it in a thinking kind of way. But then the second word offers some, some range of meaning as well. It can mean worship, but it can also mean service. The, the, the two ideas are very tied together. Is, this, is, is it a, a, just a praise to God, or is it a service to him? <laughs> And I think for both of these words, the answer is yes. Our offering to God of our total self is an act of worship, but it is an act of service. What did Jesus say? If you love me, you will what? Obey my commands. You will do. You will, you will serve others. He said, the one who wants to be greatest among you must become the servant of everyone. And so offering yourself to God, in worship, is about service. It's about doing the things that he calls us to do. It's living the way he calls us to live. That's why I've said, that's why I've kind of uh, summarized it together as all of life, thankful, surrender. Biblical worship is all of life, thankful, Surrender. This is the concept that Jesus is unpacking in that passage from John 4 that I read for the kids a little earlier. You can turn back there with me for just a few moments if you, if you like. Jesus is speaking with this Samaritan woman, and, she's, and, and he is engaging with her and offering her living water and, and she at one point says, Sir, I, I perceive that you are a prophet. Because Jesus told her, she, she said, Let me, um, Jesus said, Go call your, your husband. She said, No, I don't have a husband. And she said, You're right. The person you're currently living with isn't your husband, and you've had five husbands before him. The lady's like, Whoa, I'm dealing with somebody who knows things, even without me having to tell them anything. And so this is the question that she chooses to ask him, whether she's trying to get off that topic and distract Jesus with something else, or whether this was a real question burning in her heart all along, and Jesus was the perfect person to answer it. She, she says, where is the place to worship? Where is the right place to go to worship? Is it our mountain in Samaria, or is it your mountain, the Jewish mountain in, in uh, Jerusalem? Jesus says to her, Believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. But he says, True worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. 
What does it mean to worship the Father in spirit and in truth? It's worship that is empowered by the Holy Spirit. It's not, it's not worship that is tied to a place. It's worship that is tied to the, the indwelling of the Spirit that is with us, whether we're on that mountain or that mountain or that valley or wherever we are. It's worship that is in spirit. It is, it is infused by it and, and enlivened by and made possible by the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And it is in truth. It is based on the truth of who God is, first and foremost, displayed to us in Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ is the way that it is the one that makes this kind of worship possible. Isn't he? Jesus Christ is, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And so in Jesus, the truth, we have access to the Father. The book of Hebrews says we can boldly approach his throne of grace with confidence, looking for help in our time of need. We have access to the Father, not, not because he just said, well, you know, you've done some bad stuff, but ah, whatever, forget it all. You know, let's just start over. No, because he took that, that wrath that we deserve and he poured it out on his son, Jesus. He bore that penalty for us. He raised him up to life again, proving that his sacrifice was sufficient and that we too have the promise of eternal life. Identification with him. And so worshiping God in spirit and in truth, I like the way that, that uh, one of my uh, professors, uh, Dave Dunlauter, put it, it is worship that is empowered by and focused on Jesus. It's worship that is empowered by and focused on Jesus. We worship based on the truth who Jesus is and all that he has done for us. And we worship in a way that is empowered by his spirit. He said, it's to your benefit that I go. Because if I don't go, the spirit won't come, come to you. But when I go, I will send the spirit and he will teach you. He will bring things to your mind about me. He will convict the world regarding sin, righteousness, and judgment. What is worship? It is all of life surrender that is empowered by and focused on Jesus. I like the way that uh, the writer Bob Coughlin put it. He said, nothing against skill, practice, complexity, nuance, musicianship, or sincerity, but only the finished work of Christ makes our offerings of worship acceptable in God's eyes. See, it's, it's Acceptable worship, the kind of worship that God is seeking, is not about, is not about how good I am at preaching or playing the piano or, or singing, whatever it is. Acceptable worship to God is worship that is in spirit and in truth. It is worship in Christ. The finished work of Christ makes my offering of worship acceptable to God. It's the kind of worship that God is seeking. And Coughlin follows it up by, with, the, with the statement, what a relief. Amen? What a relief. That in Christ, my broken, sometimes half-hearted, lifestyle of, of submission to him is acceptable. Worship. What implications does this have for, for our lives? This is, the, uh, this is a book that has really informed my thinking a lot in studying this topic. It's called Worship Matters by Bob Coughlin, the guy I just quoted. And he talks about, in one of these chapters, later in the book, he talks about some of the implications that this has. And I wanted to read it for you. He says that the New Testament writers consistently take Old Testament words related to worship, words like altar, sacrifice, priest, temple, and they apply them to life in general. Evangelism is worship. Paul spoke of how he served or worshipped God, quote, with my whole heart in preaching the gospel of his son, Romans chapter 1, verse 9. 
Serving others is worship. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God, Hebrews 13, 16. We're going to look at that in a moment. Giving is worship. Paul referred to financial gifts as a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God in Philippians 4, 18. Do you, see, do you start to see the implications here? If, if worship is not about this particular time and place, although we must include this in that, in the scope of what we're talking about, but it's not just this, if it has to do with the way that I'm living my life as a sacrifice, a living sacrifice, set apart to God, then, then what can we add to this list? What does it look like when all of life is engaged in this act of worship in God? Is cleaning up your child's vomit at 2 a.m.? <laughs> Or teaching them for the millionth time they shouldn't run with scissors. Or trying one more time to read the Bible with them before bed. Even though it didn't work last night. Are these acts of worship? You worship by surrendering to his call on you to train up your child in the way they should go. What about putting up with an annoying boss or, or co-workers, maybe employees that won't pull their weight? Serving faithfully in the midst of corruption, being a voice for those who are harassed in the workplace or at school. Is this, can this be worship? Can this be a life sacrifice, evidence of life sacrifice to God? You worship by surrendering to his call on you to be salt and light in your family, in your job, in your school. To do everything to the glory of God. That is the call he has made on our lives. Will we surrender to his call? Worship is about all of life, thankful, surrender. But I want to... I want to make something very clear here. There's a key to this that we need to make sure we're emphasizing. And it's, it's there when Jesus talks about worshiping in spirit and in truth. This kind of worship, this all of life surrender, is made possible by the Holy Spirit, not by our own strength. Ephesians chapter 5 unpacks this for us when it says, don't be, don't get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery or dissipation, depending on translation. Don't get drunk with wine. Don't be controlled by this substance, but instead be controlled by this substance. He says, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. And then he goes on to talk about what that looks like. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing, making melody in your hearts to the Lord. The last thing he mentions is submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And so this is why I want to I want to use this for a moment. I'm going to put it up here. Maybe we can need the screen up a little bit or something so I don't do some damage. This is you. Not literally. Figuratively. <laughs> We're all tracking here. If worship is all of life, surrender to God based on the finished work of Christ and the power of the Spirit, then what life ought to look like is not me in my own strength pouring out my energies and my, my time and whatever into the lives of others, but actually being filled with the Spirit, so that I am able to pour myself out into the lives of others. But the problem is, so often, I, my concern is, the way we think about worship is, I come to church on Sunday, and I get filled. And then I go out into my life, and I'm trying to worship God, I'm, I'm pouring myself out, I'm, I'm being, I'm sacrificing 
for him, of trying to live the way that he called me to live, but sometimes I feel pretty dry. And it's like, what do I do in those moments? Well, try harder, right? <laughs> There's still some drops in there. I think I can get them if I just try a little harder. Right? What if the Christian life is not this, but it's this? That as I go through life, I'm being filled by the Spirit, not just on Sunday, but every day. And from that place of overflow, the Spirit is impacting the lives of those around me. And as I'm filled with the Spirit, my life is overflowing into other spheres of life, into my workplace, into my family. And so, yes, I come together on Sunday to receive the, the, the work of the Spirit in my life. But it's not just about Sunday, it's about each and every day being filled with the Spirit. And then when people bump into me along the way, what comes out? The Spirit. The, the work of the Spirit comes out of me naturally, not, not something that I'm squeezing out, forcing out. I've got to be good. I've got to be a good person. But no, I'm being filled with the Spirit. I'm being empowered by Him. And it's a place of overflow that enables me to live this kind of life of surrender that I'm called to live. I've got good news for you. This illustration is an imperfect one. You know how? The spirit is not this. He's a garden hose that's attached somewhere that never runs out. And you can keep receiving that filling of the Spirit. He is able to empower us for this kind of work. This is what we're talking about. All of life's surrender to God that is empowered by, focused on Him. God does not command us to do things that He doesn't also empower us to do. But we've got to be placing ourselves in, in places where the Spirit's power can be at work in us, can be filling us up, so that we can have an impact on those around us. I'll take that screen back now. <laughs> Thanks. Where are the places God has called you to a life of thankful surrender? What are the spheres of life that God has given you the opportunity to exercise this kind of worship? Ask yourself, how can I build habits into my life for all of life surrender? How can I build those habits into my life that I'm being filled daily I would encourage you to start with focusing on the gospel. Remember in Romans chapter 12, he says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God, in view of God's mercy, because of what God has done. Think about the gospel. What has God done for you in Christ Jesus? Let that be the starting point for this filling. If worship is about the way that I live out a life of thankful surrender, well then what's the big deal about getting together here on a Sunday morning? Why do we do this? God knows our weaknesses. I love that song. There's a song that says, God knows our frame, that we are just dust. <coughs> what's the problem? The problem is, so often, I'm not aligning myself with spirit. I might be quenching the spirit. I might be ignoring the spirit's leading, being disobedient to him. I might have other things that come in and, and cloud my view so I, it's hard to even see. Is, is God really working in my life? Is the spirit actually doing anything here? And so... 
He has placed us in a family so that we can have regular help in keeping ourselves under the flow, so to speak, of the Spirit. You see this idea summarized at the end of Hebrews chapter 13. So turn there. This is the passage that we read, that Paul read for us, and we followed along a little earlier. What are the implications for corporate worship? Is if, if worship is about a life of surrender to God, then what does that mean for when we get together? Look at specifically verses 15 to 16. Through him, then, notice that this is empowered by Jesus. Through him, not, not on your own strength or, or build up your spiritual muscles to get to this point. He says, through him, through Jesus, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. So when we come together here, there needs to be a vertical dimension to our worship. We come here together to fo focus our attention on him, right? To turn our attention to this one that we worship. Let us, he says, continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. It's not about, first and foremost, it's not about the songs that we sing or the preaching or anything else. These are tools to help us bring praise, thanksgiving, and renewed surrender of our lives to God in Christ Jesus. And as I already mentioned, just as our personal, just as our personal lives of worship are empowered by Christ, by union with Him, then our corporate life is centered on Him, empowered by His Holy Spirit. He says, in Him, let us offer up to God sacrifices. You see, sometimes I need, I need to be poured into. The Spirit wants to use somebody else to pour into me when we come together on a Sunday morning. Sometimes the Spirit wants to use me to be the one to pour into somebody else when we come together on a Sunday morning. I would argue it's pretty much always both of those things are supposed to be happening. When we come together, we come together to be pouring into one another as we focus on God together. So the question we need to ask is, are we placing ourselves under the Spirit's flow when we come together? Are we focusing our own attention and directing each other's attention to the truth of Christ? There needs to be a vertical dimension to our worship, but there also needs to be a horizontal dimension to our worship. And that's what I was just sort of talking about there. See, we, we come together to focus on God together. But there's the key word, together. It's not just about me focusing on God. I want you to focus on God. And if there's a way that I can be helpful in that process, whether it's by singing alongside you as a testament to the truth of these things that we are singing, whether it's by, by stopping you in the hallway and praying for you because I hear about what you're going through, whether it's by talking after the service, like, how, how is God speaking to you today in this, in Sunday school or in the sermon or whatever? When we come together, it's a time of sharing with each other. This is, and this is seen in verse 16. After saying, through him let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name, he then also says, do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. We come together to share, to share what we have, encouragement, strengthening, reminders of who God is and the truth of his word. Corporate worship here together cannot replace the life of worship that we're called to, but it can help to shape refocus, bolster, and encourage and energize our 
lives of worship, our individual lives of worship. That only happens as we are focused on encouraging, building up one another. How does this happen? All kinds of ways. The Bible talks a lot about prayer, in, in especially the early church and, and in the epistles. The centrality of prayer, praying together as we come together. Singing, Colossians 3.16, makes the point very strongly that when we come together, we, we sing and make melody in our hearts to the Lord. And that, that passage from Ephesians, when it talks about singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in your hearts to the Lord, that's talking about corporate worship together. And by the way, in case you're tempted to say, okay, well, so psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, that's the three types of music we're allowed to use. Guess how many words in the Greek language refer to songs or sing, uh, singing songs? There's three words in the Greek for, sing, for songs. They are the words psalms, hymns, and songs. There's three Greek words for singing, the act of singing, or the, 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 the type of the songs that we sing. And so Paul, in writing that, is not necessarily saying these are the only three options. He's saying, I'm going to use whatever words I've got to describe singing together, and that's what you ought to be doing for the purpose of building each other up, glorifying our Savior together. We sing. We pray. We preach. 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul says, devote yourself to the preaching of God's word. He also says to devote yourself to, to the public reading of Scripture later in that chapter. So reading Scripture together. We share meals. See that all over the book of Acts. We welcome new believers in baptism. We participate in the Lord's Supper together. These are ways that we, as we come together, we refocus, shape, and energize our lives of worship. So how? What does it look like? All these kinds of things. Who? Who should be doing this? I want to read for you 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Flipping over to chapter 14. Verse 26, what then, brothers and sisters, what does this look like? When you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. Do you hear what he's saying there? Let's not get, we don't have time to get into all the, you know, speaking in tongues, revelation, all that, some of the stuff that Paul's dealing with in this chapter. The bottom line there that he's saying is, everything we're doing is to be for the building up of the body. And each person has a role to play. Each person brings something. He says earlier in this whole section of 1 Corinthians about the gifts of the Spirit, he says, you know, you're not all, you're not all a hand or a foot in the body of Christ. The hand can't say to the eye, I don't need you. No, each of us has a role to play as we come together here. Corporate worship is not a spectator sport. Amen. As we come together, we come together for the purpose of mutual edification. So maybe for some of us, we need to think differently about our approach to Sunday morning. Maybe instead of thinking, I hope we do the stuff that I like in service, we need to ask God to help us say, I trust God is going to use one of my brothers or sisters to build me up today, and I want to be used by him to build somebody else up as we worship together. Maybe for some of us, we need to, to think differently about the way that we're serving here on a Sunday morning. Instead of perhaps feeling bad that you can't get into the zone because you're focusing on, i got to get up and, and play a song, or I gotta, I, I'm doing a scripture reading today, so I have to you know, think about that, and I can't really focus on the song. Perhaps instead, think about the way that God might be using your example to encourage somebody else. And think, I'm so glad that I get to serve God as an act of worship here today. 
Don't think for a moment that teaching a children's program on a Sunday morning causes you to miss out on worship. Those who serve in this way are building up the body and glorifying God. That's worship. They're participating with us. That doesn't mean that they should never, that, that all of our teachers should never be here a part of, of the singing and the scripture reading. No, it needs to be a sharing of those responsibilities. But it's not like this is the worship and that's just something else. Worship is meant to be expressed in all of life as we are filled with the Spirit to experience renewed levels of thankful surrender. And this is shaped, refocused, and energized in a unique way as we come together. So, let's do it. Let's be people that are focused on each other and helping each other to come together to worship God together as we meet. And then as we go from here, let's be people that are displaying lives of worship in the way that we live day by day. How do we summarize and implement these things? <clears throat> Cultivate a lifestyle of worship. What can praise, thanksgiving, submission, and trust look like in your daily routine? Remember that these things must be informed by the truth of Scripture. You've got to be getting into God's Word and have to be empowered by the Spirit. And then secondly, focus on mutual edification as we come together to worship. Asking yourself the question, who am I most concerned about on a Sunday morning? Myself or others? Now let me clarify something. It's not wrong to connect more with a certain kind of music than, than, than others, or to connect more with a certain preaching style or whatever. That's part of the way that God has wired us differently. You should be edified when we come together. The problem is when it becomes a self-centered focus. That's, that, that is the central piece of what I'm doing here. It's just about me. I, I, I need to get something out of this. If you're coming to church with an empty cup, then first of all, you need to be here. Because you need someone else to spill over into your life. You need God to be speaking into your life. That's the first and foremost thing. But then secondly, you need to kind of go back to Go back to this first point and say, if I'm, if I'm just empty and dry consistently, I'm not talking about seasons. There are seasons of life where, you know, God takes us through valleys and there's a season of dryness and, and we go in and out of those things. But I'm talking about consistent dryness where it's like, I'm just, I got nothing left to give. Then this needs to be a key question. What am I doing to cultivate a lifestyle of worship? What am I doing to cultivate closeness with God in my day-to-day -day routine? Jesus said God is actually seeking worshipers who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. How are we doing? What is our focus as we come together? Where is our focus when we go from here to our homes, to our jobs, to our vacations, to families, to schools, or communities? Are we worshipers who the Father is seeking in Christ? We all. We have the power of His Spirit to be. Let's pray. Lord, we need you. We sang that song earlier. Lord, I need you. Every hour, I need you. Fill us with your Spirit so that we might worship you in spirit and in truth, so that we might live lives surrendered to you, living sacrifices, making our lives living sacrifices holy and acceptable to you. Thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ, which makes all of this possible, which covers us. Thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit, who is a seal on our hearts. He is proof working in us that we know you. We are, we are looking forward to that day when the limitations of sin and all these other 
distractions and things will be cast aside and we will see you face to face and we will be truly worshiping you every single moment. We look to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.